later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. <laughs> then a cloud overshadowed them, and from that cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, no one told you life was going to be this way. This is the opening, this line from the theme song to the sitcom Friends, but also uh, is a great Pavlovian response from millennials, and they all clap. It's great. Um, but it's also a frame for what sitcoms actually do. So I, I've mentioned this before, that um, uh, in the mid-90s to the very early 2000s, I essentially downloaded into my brain the entire corpus of American sitcoms because I frankly just did not have very much to do and could not sleep at night. And so uh, what I would do is in the afternoons, I would watch reruns of relatively, at that time, modern sitcoms, your home improvements, your friends, your Frasers, uh, your Just Shoot Me, your whatever, right? Um, in the early evening, um, I would watch must-see TV, and so I would get the, the very latest sitcoms downloaded in my brain. And then when I could not sleep at night, I would watch Nick at Night uh, for anything from the, the mid-40s forward, uh, from I Love Lucy, The Munsters, Bewitched, uh, to Happy Days. I think I've mentioned before, I'm not sure I realized the time that Happy Days wasn't from the 50s. Now again, this sounds, I'm sure, very dumb to your ears, because some of you remember when it was on air. I don't. I only know it from Nick at Night, and it was about the 1950s, and it took me a really long time to realize it was the 1970s reflecting on the 1950s, and a lot of that was because, well, Ron Howard just isn't old enough to have been that old in the 50s, and that made me look it up. But until that moment, I didn't know. Sitcoms are a remarkable art form because they give us the tools to process and laugh at the absurdity of the mundane, right? Sitcoms, by their nature, are not set in interesting places. Mo the core set of most sitcoms is a vaguely overly large suburban house or a million-dollar apartment owned by 20-year-olds in New York. But it's usually just one or two domestic sets, maybe an inside and outside. Even as we branched out in more modern times to like sitcoms based at offices or sitcoms based at schools or sitcoms based at uh, warehouses, right? But it's still just like a warehouse, a school, an office. And even then, it's very seldom about the work that happens there. The, the sitcom The Office is not really about selling paper. It's about the relation, inter-office relationships and how ridiculous those can be. But it is always just reality, not even turned up to 11, but if reality lives at a 5, it's just reality turned up to an 8 or a 9 to point out the absurdity. For us to laugh not at other people's problems, really, but laugh at our own problems, laugh at our own concerns, laugh at our own foibles. It just holds up a mildly absurd mirror to tell us that life is going to be this way. And the plots start to write themselves, right? So I, we're gonna do. We're, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get pitch you a sitcom. This is not one I've watched. This is just because I've downloaded all of sitcoms into my brain and occasionally get the opportunity to write some myself uh, for worship services. So okay, here's here is. So this is a sitcom sketch about a men's fear of balding, right? Very normal 
fear, men's fear of balding. And so, okay, guy uh, wakes up, um, guy's middle-aged, um, wakes up in the morning, um, and there is now a bunch of hair on his pillow. He pats the top of his head, he gets a mirror, maybe comically, right? You watch him try to like use his wife's makeup mirror to get a view of the top of his head. He can't see anything, he gets in the shower because he has to go to work. In the shower, he has his phone out, because this is just a little bit of a sword. He is scrolling through different like, you know, hair loss treatment options, and he's just psychotically ordering them all at the same time. Then what will emerge is now he doesn't want his family to know that he's worried about losing his hair. And so he is waiting by the door for the UPS guy to arrive so that he can be one, the one getting the packages and not have to show his family what he has ordered. And so the doorbell rings, and it's the Girl Scouts. And so he buys a bunch of cookies hurriedly and shoes them away. A doorbell rings, and it's Jehovah's Witnesses. And he says whatever he needs to say to get them on their way. And then finally a doorbell rings, and it's the UPS guy. But you see him and his wife both run at the door at the same time, run into each other, fall over. There's one of two possible punchlines to this entire joke, right? Either... The man really is losing his hair. And he will now, him and his wife, will have an emotional conversation while he will learn something. Or the better punchline is it's his wife's hair that, and she's the one losing her hair and she also ordered the same things that he does and now they have a lifetime supply of hair loss treatment because they're both losing their hair. Right. Other than it taken to a six or a seven, it may be a nine. These are very real human problems. People worry about these things. I, I know what it is, not about losing my hair, but about a thing that I've broken in the house that now I need to fix and sitting and waiting for the UPS guy to arrive so I can sprint to the door and fix the thing that I've definitely broken. They give us these tools to process our own lives. They give us the tools so that we will know that life will indeed be this way. A plot line I've never forgotten from Home Improvement, right? The guy uh, has, a, has to vacuum the house. He hates vacuuming. Um, you know, his wife usually does the vacuuming because it's sitcoms. And so he wants to now improve the vacuum so that it goes faster. Um, and so he's Tim the Toolman Taylor, and so he takes the tools out of the shed, and he upgrades it. And the punchline of this one is now the uh, vacuum now has power suck mode that is so strong, it's now just like pulling the furniture and the children, and everyone's flying in the vortex. But it starts with the very real problem of vacuuming is just annoying, and it's just slow, and any technology that will make it go faster, any one of us would welcome. Again, these are real-life things just taken to a nine, eight, seven, eight, or nine. I think the transfiguration <laughs> isn't funny, perhaps. But if we read it the right way, is telegraphing to us that life is going to be this way. And that we should perhaps let go of our expectations of what we think life and the Lord, and everything else in between, is going to work. And the way we normally talk about the transfiguration isn't wrong, it just misses one of the points the transfiguration is trying to show us. Right, this is certainly an incredible image of the grandeur of God, right? We're up a mountaintop, and so already we're in this kind of liminal, abnormal, beautiful space, and and we see Jesus transfigured uh, in modern parlance. Jesus gets a glow up, right? And so he's, he, you know, before modern bleach, getting anything white was really difficult. Uh, and so the, you, you hear this in this, like, yeah, that no one on earth could bleach. Yeah, because bleach back then was terrible. And so, like, he is just gleaming white. Everything's beautiful. And then you get the, like, all-star cast returning from the Old Testament, you get Elijah, and you get Moses, this great exclamation point that, yeah, Moses was cool, and Elijah was awesome, but like Jesus is even more important than these guys, because here he is amongst their company, the most august company of Old Testament figures, and God pipes up and says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And I love Peter in this moment. 
And Mark, who seldom gives us details, even gives us a little bit of characterization uh, for Peter picking up in verse 5. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 6 says, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. It's just like he's just saying stuff, right? He just, he loses all control over his mouth, and he just feels like he needs to say something. It's like, let's build a retreat center. Because he wants to stay in this moment. Right? And who wouldn't? Right? They have been, especially in Mark, they've been traveling around, they've been starving, they've seen Jesus do healings, they believe, right? But they have not had those, like, really big moments to hang their hat on. And here it is. Here's the moment. It's all being revealed exactly as they believed, as they hoped, as they had been taught, right? So this could put all doubt out of their mind. This really is the dude. We heard the voice of God Finally, now we're just going to come down from this mountain and he's going to be shining and that's going to be really obvious and we're going to have Moses and Elijah with us. Great! We're going to win right now! I know Jesus in chapter 8 has just talked about how they're going to kill him, but maybe not! Nope. Next shot. Pan to Peter, pan up to God, pan back. Jesus is dressed and is a semi-homeless traveling rabbi, son of a carpenter. No one else is there. The fair has left town. And then they go back down the mountain and the rest of chapter 9 is spent with Jesus dealing with conflict with the religious authorities and the healing of an epileptic boy and this whole contest between him and the existing religious officials and it's just straight back into the muck that is literally going to kill him um, in about eight chapters. Excuse me, seven chapters. They don't stay up there. They don't stay in that moment of grandeur. They come back down into the real world. Jesus is indeed the Son of God. As claimed here, as claimed at his baptism, as revealed fully in the resurrection, in the ascension, right? Like, we have a lot of these historical moments that talk to his reality, but the way the world experienced him in his earthly form was not really anything that looked like the glorious son of God listened to him, looked a lot like a semi-homeless traveling rabbi son of a carpenter, which is just not what you expect God to look like. You do not expect. And we we close our eyes. We imagine something that looks more like the Greek Titan Kronos or the Greek god Zeus. We don't imagine a semi-homeless traveling rabbi son of a carpenter. But even after his major glow-up, he goes back to being a semi-homeless traveling rabbi, son of a carpenter, deeply enmeshed in this horrific religious conflict and the, you know, real problems of life. You know, can you imagine having an epileptic kid in a world where you don't even know what epilepsy is, uh, much less have any concept of what to do with it? It's just sometimes your kid just fundamentally falls apart. That's terrifying as a parent, as a grandparent, as anyone connected to the life of a child. And that's what Jesus goes back to do. He doesn't live up on the uh, Peter's uh, impromptu retreat center, which was basically the word there essentially comes down to tabernacle. He, Peter wants to, this to be like what they did with the Ark of the Covenant uh, before it got installed in the temple. Right? That, okay, we're going to build like an ark we're going to build a tabernacle for you and Elijah and Moses, and we're just going to have this, like, you know, we can have this traveling, the, tra- the tabernacle can travel along, and we can show people that the, just like the thing in the temple, but this is, like, better, because this is, like, literal Moses and literal Elijah and literal God. It's amazing. Nope. Straight back to semi-homeless traveling rabbi, son of a car, trading a kid for epilepsy, fighting with the religious authorities who should know 100% who he is. 
It's the point of Matthew's birth narrative, right? Um, is that, you know, as we've talked about a few weeks back, that, yeah, yeah, these Zoroastrian priests get it, and the temple hierarchy, oh, no, they get it, and then Herod tries to kill him. Right? That same conflict now carried forward, made way through Jesus' journey, is catching up with him. And I don't want to take away, I don't want to at any point take away the grandeur of God. But I want to give us the tools for when things don't feel all that grand. I want us to know that someone did indeed tell us that life was going to be this way. We just don't talk about it. A lot of the Bible, a lot of the New Testament, boils down to it's not going to look like we're winning. But God, in fact, wins in the end. If you think about the arc of Jesus' life and ministry, as we begin our Lenten journey, which is, yes, a journey towards resurrection, but is first a journey towards the cross, for a good chunk of that journey, it looks like a semi-homeless traveling rabbi son of a carpenter builds a following, that following turns on him, and then a combination of the temple hierarchy and Rome put him to death. This is why you shouldn't skip Good Friday service. Because Good Friday service exists to force you to sit in that moment where the semi-homeless, traveling rabbi, son of a carpenter, gets made dead by the people who make a lot of people dead. The Romans! And you have to sit in there. And if you wonder about what it means to have faith when things don't appear to be going well, and then know the joy of Easter morning when it turns out that God does win, even against the Romans in death itself. We're nearing the end of our journey through Revelation in uh, Bible study, and we're getting to the fun, I teased this last week, we're getting to the fun part, where now God wins, and the new Jerusalem descends. But that, uh, as Trudy can attest, that does, the winning has it, we're, we've, we have finished through chapter 18, we have not started winning yet! It has only gotten worse! And the whole world has abandoned us, and they keep killing the prophets, and they, they're just, they really love the beast, and they're worshiping the beast, and they're so happy that the beast is so powerful. Everyone loves the beast. And in chapter 19, spoilers, Trudy, for Tuesday, uh, it's gonna, we're going to win. We're going to start the winning. But that doesn't come until chapter 19 of Revelation. The Bible only has four more chapters. 19, 20, 1, and 2. That's it. So, when all of life does not look like the transfiguration, when your faith in existence, in the life of the church, in the state of Christianity in the world, does not look like Jesus glowing and Elijah and Moses hanging out and God booming and everyone listening and Peter's so stoked he wants to start a retreat center. When it looks a lot more like the life of a semi-homeless traveling rabbi, son of a carpenter, fighting with religious authorities and healing really sick kids who are desperate... Well, we were told it was going to be like this. Someone did actually tell us life was going to be this way. Part of a life of faith is to let go of our expectations of what this is all going to look like. That it's not going to look. Use a football story because today is football Sunday. Right? It is not going to look like you're up four scores at the start of the fourth quarter. It's not going to look like that. And we have this sense memory 
even I, who didn't necessarily grow up in this world, just with a whole bunch of people who remember this world, where the church was triumphant, where we just kind of ran the country, just kind of ran what felt like at one point was literally ran the world, though that was not our highest moment. And it was just like everyone went to church and it really just looked like some sort of even march of Christian progress. And we could, you know, uh, tell the story a lot, right? There was a time in the Methodist church we remember that the Methodist bishops would write a letter to the president and the president would care what the Methodist bishops thought because they represented so much power that we could sway nations with our mere words. Sounds a lot like we're up on a mountain and Jesus is glowing and there's Elijah and there's Moses and there's the booming voice of God and it's all tremendous. We've come down off that mountaintop. And we look around and we go, where is God? It's all gone wrong. Oh my God. It's all falling apart. Oh my God. The church is dying. Is the local church, the global church, the denomination? Somebody's dying. What are we going to do? Well, welcome to the valley, friends. We've been here before. We'll be here again. And what the New Testament was actually written to tell you, because those people were, you know, people first reading the New Testament were at risk of dying from the Romans. They probably knew people who had been killed by the Romans. By the time the New Testament finishes getting written with Revelation, the Romans have really spun up. The post-Nero persecutions have really got going. And so it's a bunch of people who are living incredibly risky lives uh, for this God that is going to win in the end. And, you know, it's going to be 200 for the New Testament finishes to when that we become the official religion of Rome. is another 250 years. So it's going to be a while before anything looks good. They're in the valley as they read. The first people to read this book were in the valley. They were not on the mountaintop. They'd never known the mountaintop. They'd never seen the mountaintop. They'd only been told about the mountaintop by the three guys who were there and hadn't ascended into heaven afterwards. You want to hear more about those guys? It's inappropriate. For them. So we find ourselves in the valley. We actually have an amazing tool set to deal with this. But we have to be willing to read the flip side of Scripture. We can't just keep skimming across the top. We can't just keep going from Christmas to Palm Sunday to Easter to Pentecost and never dip down into your Ash Wednesdays, your Monday Thursdays, your Good Fridays. Because those are the services, those are the tools, those are the stories that remind us that there is real grit behind the power and strength of God that is available to you. The power and strength of God is not just there for you to remind you of how awesome things are for you all the time. The power and grit and strength of God exists for you even more so in the valley to keep your eyes on Jesus. So we need to let go of our expectations, of what God is going to look like, how life is going to go, how things are going to seem, and understand the deeper reality of God, that the entire grandeur and power of God walked the earth as a semi-homeless traveling rabbi son of a carpenter. And that shouldn't surprise us that we find God in the valleys because he walked in the valleys with us and for us. Life will be like this sometimes. Maybe, you have, maybe your life is on a mountaintop. And if so, praise God. But if your life is in a valley, or you feel like the church is in a valley, or you feel like Christianity is in a valley, don't worry. We're ready. We have the tools. We will make use of them. Life will be this way. Sometimes. God is still God. Christ is still Christ. The Spirit is still here. Faith is 
understanding them, even when it is not obvious. Let us pray. Gracious living God, we give you thanks that no matter how things appear, you win. You're here. You're with us. We have your strength, your power, and your grace. We give you thanks that you, the glorious creator of the universe, walks in the muck and the mire with us. God, help us to have faith, to let go of our expectations of grandeur, and instead understand the real work you do in us in the valley and the real work that we can do in the valley as most of the world does not know your grandeur but only knows the valley. May we find this empowering and inspiring rather than mildly depressing. Life will be like this sometimes. You win in the end. May we be a part of that. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.